Good morning, everyone, or good evening if you're in New South Wales or Australia, indeed. My name is Joanne Holland, and I'm the Executive Director of the Australian UK Chamber of Commerce. We invite you to join us for the Fourth Access UK 2021 series webinar in partnership with Investment New South Wales. Our topic today is marketing with impact, and we'll be hearing from industry leaders and fellow Australians. BBP Agency and Cygnus Media, Bell Iconic and Fuel PR on how businesses should be formulating their communication strategies to ensure maximum success when marketing to a UK-based audience. Covering the breadth of an effective communication strategy, we will be discussing the subtleties of creating memorable branding, marketing and public relations. We'll also be hearing from our um, Agent General of New South Wales, Stephen Cartwright, to give a vote of thanks. Our first speakers today are Adrian Nichols, Managing Director of BBP Agency, and Peter Brocklebank, Founder and CEO of Being Iconic. I'll first introduce Adrian. He's the MD of BBP Agency based in London, and he's been delivering clients' marketing needs for over 25 years. His experience includes helping clients scale from startups to sale, moving into new regions and territories, finding new prospects and targeting new verticals, bringing together marketing and sales for better collaboration to drive their digital transformation and alignment. He believes in always being on time and keeping promises. And Peter Brocklebank, founder and CEO of Being Iconic. Peter was formerly the MD of BBP and is now chairman. Having left the UK for warmer waters of Sydney in 2018, he founded Scale Up Specialist Consultancy Being Iconic with a purpose to support the great entrepreneurs of Australia. His focus is on working with the founders and navigating the often treacherous path of global scaling with a focus on three key pillars, commercial, marketing and culture. Welcome, Peter and Adrian. So um, we're going to start the session with uh, questions and um, I'll hand it over to Peter and Adrian to answer. And uh, firstly, um, Peter and Adrian, tell us about BBP Agency and your company ties with Australia. You want to KP? No, you can start, Adrian. I'll okay, well, so we're, um, we're, we've been going for about 20 or so years. We're, we're based in Fleet Street. Uh, we work with, as you're saying, Joanna, we work with kind of startups to global enterprises. Um, our clients kind of, their, their geography stretch all around the world. And then um, about two, three years ago, uh, Pete moved to Sydney. Um, I sort of came in to then run the, the London office. And we found more and more that we have clients that want to kind of go both into both geographies. So it just kind of made sense that we kind of get involved with yourselves and more and more we're helping and seeing where we've got clients who are asking for advice, they either come into the UK or vice versa, go to Australia. So that's how we started working kind of mutually together. Yeah, as, a, as Adrian mentioned, I, I, I run BBP for 20 years, give or, give or take a year. Um, left three years ago, so I'm now based in Sydney. Um, and some of the smaller clients when I left asked me to sort uh, to be their, their marketing director, so helping them with their marketing plans. And from that um, idea, being iconic, was born so um we we tend to focus on on, on three things and, and support um companies as they scale um looking at planning which is vitally important working with great resources like the new south wales governments and all the various uh, grants and support that might be available to help companies scale um and also then plug them into the wider finance community to give um the support that any of these founders might need as they look to recruit extra resource additional marketing budget um, and formulate their marketing plans. Excellent. So Adrian, wh why is marketing so important for new entrants into the UK? Why can't they just translate the marketing activities they're doing in Australia? Yeah, well, I think um, I won't necessarily talk about the communications. I know, I know Bex is going to talk about that later in terms of the actual language, but I guess the what we found where we're helping customers or clients is that it, it is, I mean, yes, it's always it's English, but it is a different market. 
I mean, you've got the, the different scale of the UK. So while we are kind of helping advising before people come into that market is to look at the actual size of the opportunity. And in some cases, we've actually helped people kind of save money and not come to the UK, which sounds slightly perverse. But for example, we, we worked with a company who had a competitor to Nest, which is like a home um, survey kind of alarm system. And we, and we help kind of size the audience, see how many people there's going to be. And then we worked out the competitors and actually what your market spends need to be and what's the channels to there. In, in their particular case, it was kind of too big. But often we'll, we'll help customers before they arrive, find out, you know, what is the size of the price? Should they really be entering? And then where's the best way to do it? How to find those people are kind of the best channels. And you, you did touch on culture um, briefly, mm -hmm. but it plays such an important part and certainly about the BPP agency brand. Um, and why is this? And why on a larger scale should business be looking to ensure their culture is embedded um, in their marketing activities? Perhaps, Peter, you can touch on yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, culture comes down to the best fit of, of people in a business. Um, and if you look at, I mean, we've all been in business a while. Some of the people hopefully on the call are, are experiencing growing pains and aligning culture and values of people within a business uh, epitomizes the sort of the outgoing marketing message that then, then people will see. So if, if people haven't heard of Simon Sinek, I, I would probably suggest Simon Sinek is one of the best people to talk about this. He, he's got a, a why, how, what of marketing te TED talk. And he, he talks about it brilliantly. And he talks about if you can combine um, employees, partners, and customers, and they all have the same understanding of a brand value, it really adds huge credence to that brand. And, and probably the, the best example of this, and like them or load them, um, if, if, if Apple did one, one good thing, or they've done lots of good things, but marketing is one of the main things that they, they do brilliantly. And that's because they got their, their why right. So they got their brand values aligned throughout the business, throughout their marketing. And you know, Steve Jobs, when he used to stand on stage with his infamous turtleneck, um, you know, he always talked about making the world a better place. And that's the brand values, you know, that run through Apple. You know, I've actually got a, a snippet of their brand book, which is not easy to find, but um, I managed to find it. Um, and their brand book says, the values we share at Apple inspire the work we share with everyone. At Apple, we're committed to leaving the world better than we found it. And I think you'll see with all the marketing that they do, when you go into store and you experience, you know, customer service and how they deal with you, it's all about, you know, making the world a better place and, and hopefully leaving people with a smile on your face. So if, 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 if companies as they scale can keep true to those brand values, align them with their internal team and external partners, and if needed, make them big and bold and put them on the walls of your office so everyone knows what they are. Um, values are so important. I mean, Adrian, have you got, um, you know, a comment on, you know, culture and values? Yeah, I'd, I'd say similar, similar to Pete, we want, we sort of help clients to kind of get to what's known as their value proposition. So what is it they stand for? How are they kind of different? And running through that has to be how they act as people. And, and again, we make sure that that runs through the whole building so that at every time you touch with a customer, it's got to be kind of true to that all the way down to, when you fall in, when you phone in on a call center and your TV's broken or something, you've got to make sure that the response you get is aligned to all those values. So if your if your values are around, you know, speed and honesty, let's make sure that that comes through all those different touch points. So we make sure it runs through the whole building. Um, and Peter, what's your advice to Australian companies looking to connect with the UK your audience? Um, are there current marketing strategies going to work? Um, and if not, what should they be doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, I mean, the UK and Australia, I think, as we, we were um, talking about earlier, um, they're, they're similar markets and, and, and there's, there's, there's the similarities between the two marketplaces. Um, I mean, it is, it's, it's relatively common knowledge that some of the world's largest brands actually test market in Australia. So UK brands actually test, FMCG brands test products in Australia because it's a cheaper, smaller market. And the reason they do that is because the marketplace is quite similar. We speak the same language. There's obviously words like um, flip-flops and thongs, which maybe don't mean the same thing. And if you're, a, if you're a thong company in the UK, it means something quite different to a thong company in Australia. Um, but the, the biggest thing I would, I would say is 
test is is very very easy nowadays to test things so you know once you have a a scale plan of how you're going to enter the uk market you then develop a marketing plan which hopefully helps facilitate that scale um, and for each step of that plan test so test your value proposition as, as adrian talked about earlier on your value proposition is key which is you know the main reason why any consumer or customer should care about your brand and that might be different in the uk to australia because the competition might be different so you might be able to talk about speed in australia because you're the fastest but in the uk there might be a big competitor who's quicker than you so test your value proposition test your messaging test your website a b test ads test everything and use your partners and your friends and your family and colleagues and everybody you know in the uk um, to look at things for you and give you feedback utilize that and then um, review, optimize, test again, and just keep going. I, I'd also, also add, there's a, there's a couple of really useful free tools which people can use. There's one called, um, uh, if you go to Google Think, on there they have a, a search engine results. So you can, you can put in and find where people are, what they're talking about, so you know where to target geographically. And there's another really good tool called SEMrush, which is free, where you can go, you can look at your competitor's sites and it'll tell you all the keywords that they put into their site, where all their traffic comes, you can literally borrow it and copy that and put it onto your own site. So it's, it's kind of almost a free way of understanding what your competitors are doing. You can compete them that way. So we, we often hear the concept that having a website is the mecca of marketing. I mean, is that true? And, and would you say that a successful marketing campaign should include uh, you, your website and how you work with it? And, and are you able to share some examples with us? Yeah, you, you definitely need your website because that's going to help with your SEO, your search engine optimization. That's basically your free search. So if you can make sure you kind of spend as much money as you can on that site so that when someone searches in Google, you should be second or third in the returns. And that's that that means you're not having to pay Google for those ad returns. That means your site's kind of doing its work for it. But but people still got to find you beyond that. What, what we are finding works really well at the moment is a lot of LinkedIn, especially for business to business marketing. So in there, there's a really good tools, things like InMails, where you can go and build um, quite niche um, lists or, or groups of customers to go after. So we use that a lot. But again, we're driving traffic to those websites. And then what we would advise when people get to, the, get to your site is try and give them something that's going to be of value that they're going to give up, say, their email address. So some piece of gated communication or, or insight, which could be a skinny white paper or something sort of it, it quite quick and easy to do, but it still feels valuable. And for that, people give you email addresses and therefore you can start to build yourself your sales pipeline. And Peter, um, when you're working with Australian companies, what changes do you find yourself flagging? I mean, sentiment, tone, humour, um, and what would you say essentially are the traps to those listening today and how can they avoid them um, when they're looking to mark their business to a UK audience? Um, well, as I mentioned before, we're, we're relatively fortunate that, that language is the same. So that's, that's, that's the main thing. Um, I mean, if you do the research in advance, hopefully nothing should shock you as you progress. Um, and there's obviously going to be um, some curveballs, you know, thrown in as you, as you scale. Um, but we, we need to ask, you know, we need to, the, the, the great thing with technology nowadays and, you know, the six degrees of separation is you can generally find people who can um, answer the questions that you need. Um, but one of, one of the biggest issues, I think, is just the assumption that it's going to work. So, yes, we're speaking English, but it's, it, is, it is a different world. I mean, I know because I've lived in Sydney for three years. You know, both countries are wonderful countries, but but they are different. There's a, there's a, 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 a different speed of, of life, particularly in London. It's a lot more hectic, I think, as a, as a lot of people who've been to London will, will experience. And, and, and Sydney and Australia is probably a bit more laid back. Um, so I think the, the broad brushstrokes of your marketing plan and everything that you deliver will be similar. But just don't assume it's going to work. So as I mentioned earlier on, you know, test the value props, test the messaging. You'll probably find that most of them are right. But if you can, if you can get a plan that you're confident and you can have partners in the UK that can reassure you that what you're doing is going to be right, it's a lot easier to then scale in the right direction. 
That's excellent. And, and Peter and Adrian, thank you so much for your contribution. We're going to come back to you later in the question and answer. There's still some other questions I have for you. Um, but now we're going to move on to communications. And I'd like to introduce uh, this evening, this morning, uh, Beck O'Connor, who's the creative director and co-founder at Insignus, a creative communications agency based in Holborn, London. And Beck started her career in factual television and documentaries in Australia and uh, the UK before moving into the branded content area. And at Insignus, she works with clients in technology, finance, and the charity sectors, producing holistic communication strategies and overseeing all creative content. Welcome, Beck. Hi, Joanne. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Beck, can you share with us a little bit about Insignus and your journey and how and why, as Aussies, you decided to set up a creative communications agency in the UK? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Insignus sort of came about as a bit of a meeting of minds um, with myself and my business partner and co-founder Nick. Um, as you said, Joanne, my background originally was in um, television, both in Australia and here in the UK. Um, and then I moved into more sort of video marketing. Um, and Nick's background originally was in um, political campaigns. Um, and producing comms campaigns um, for big corporate clients as well. So we sort of joined forces to create Insignus. And what that sort of looks like is, you know, Nick heads up all of that strategy, and then I head up all of that um, sort of um, creative content production to help actually put that strategy into place for our clients. Um, and then in terms of setting up in the UK, for us, it was really um, about the breadth of opportunity here, to be honest. Um, it's, a, it's a massive market. There's, there's a lot of opportunity for us to work with incredible clients, um, but also what attracts us to using London as a base is, is really that global outlook as well. Um, we are very passionate about having a global outlook and so are our clients. So that's a huge draw card for us as well. So you've done it, Beck, and within Sydney. And so what advice do you have for Australian businesses looking to launch or scale up in the UK? And um, how can having a communication plan help them settle in uh, a lot quicker than um, otherwise would? Yeah, so to be honest, my, my advice is certainly have that communication strategy in place from the very beginning. I think, you know, you, you're obviously doing all of that hard work um, and that graft beforehand with your marketing plan, like um, Peter and Adrian were talking about before. But I think there's no point in doing all of that hard work and then having no communication strategy in place to then communicate that to your audience in the UK. I think also there's a sort of um, misconception that communication strategies are, are just for really large companies. I would say that even if you can count on one hand how many people are in your business or in the UK arm of your business, you still need to be thinking about a communication strategy, um, particularly launching into a new market. Don't forget that you're not just talking to your customer. You're also going to be talking with lots of other stakeholders, you know, government bodies. Maybe you're looking for investment over here as well. So you need to all be singing from the same song sheet. And if you arrive in this new market speaking confidently with clarity about your brand, you're going to make a big first impression and it's going to legitimise what you're doing as well. Well, just on that topic of brand development, um, would you say that it's um, executed differently in the UK than in Australia? Um, and for example, would you say to Australian businesses who already have successful brands back at home and now want to access the UK market, um, what would you say to them? Um, and, you know, are there cultural differences and do they need to be aware of them? Yeah, yeah. So um, my biggest advice around this is sort of twofold. Um, First, and I think and Peter and Adrian were definitely um, talking about this as well. First of all, I would say do not assume that what has differentiated you in Australia is going to differentiate you in, in the UK. Um, that it, it might be the case that that still works, but it, 
you may still need to find some kind of new facet to that to kind of connect with your audience um, and other stakeholders here. Um, so I would recommend putting in that hard work to begin with, as Peter and Adrian were saying, to test that out. Um, my second piece of advice would be to not assume that the fact that your business is Australian is enough to differentiate you here in this market. Um, sometimes I do see brands um, leaning on that perhaps a little bit too much. I think in Australia there, there is a reputation for Australian businesses um, around being sort of fresh and modern and very innovative. Um, but that doesn't always get appreciated over here necessarily. I think sometimes businesses over here or, or customers could be like, oh, I mean, you're Australian, that's really cute, but why else are you good? <laughs> um, so those are my sort of two big pieces of advice around that. And, and what clients, um, Beck, do you typically work with? Um, and could you give some examples to us for, um, you know, in, for situations where you've devised a successful communication strategy? Um, and do you have any clients you've worked with where you've thought they've connected with their UK audience very well? Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of our clients are in software or cybersecurity, um, certainly sort of in that digital sphere. Um, and something that works really quite well um, for a lot of businesses that we work with is focusing on thought leadership. And again, this sort of connects to um, what I was talking about just before about finding something to, new to differentiate you in this market. By sort of focusing on thought leadership, you can really communicate that quite strongly. And we sort of take a bit of a uh, both a reactive and a proactive approach in terms of thought leadership. So we're sort of looking at what's being talked about here in the UK. Um, and also, as I was saying, we've got this great global outlook here in the UK. So we can also kind of look beyond um, and, and speak about topics that are impacting other markets as well. Um, and so, yeah, we want to sort of, um, we then will create content that sort of helps communicate um, that thought leadership out on those topics. But then in terms of a proactive response, it's about thinking, okay, what? so looking at what differentiates us here, what can we then talk about that's new and fresh that our competitors aren't talking about and we can actually lead that conversation, we start it um, and we'll sort of produce content um, talking about those topics um, as well. So, yeah, we find that... Um, having a thought leadership approach um, can be really, really effective. And, and what about other communications? Um, what are you finding to be the most popular way for businesses to connect with their audience? And have you got any platforms that you uh, recommend? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So for us, uh, obviously with my background, um, we do a lot, a lot, a lot of video um, and we find it really, really effective. Um, and I think also there's a misconception that video is really hard to do, but actually um, it has been sort of democratised and is a lot simpler and quicker and easier to do than you might think um, and doesn't require as much sort of time intensive uh, sort of dedication. So we use a lot of video to sort of enact that kind of thought leadership um, strategy piece that I was just talking about before. Um, and that can be um, videos with your team, but also it's, it's really effective to get um, other stakeholders involved in your video content. Um, it's a way to reach out to potential customers, get them involved, help give them a platform to share their voice. Um, but also it's a great way to build relationships with other partners that could help, you know, you can both help each other um, to find the same audience. Um, and in terms of where you put these videos, obviously social media um, is incredibly effective. Um, we quite like LinkedIn as well at the moment. Again, as, as Adrian and Peter were saying for B2B, um, we find that's um, really great. Um, but to be honest, all the social media platforms at the moment are really pushing for video and for longer form video as well. 
Um, and then also, of course, um, video is also really great to use, um, even just in meetings when you're meeting with new stakeholders or new customers. Um, they're a really useful tool to have in your arsenal. So, yeah, absolutely, video, 100% for me. <laughs> oh, well, th <laughs> thank you, Beck, for that takeaway. Look, thank you very much for discussing uh, communication strategies. We will come back to you later with some further questions. Um, but we are now on to public relations. And I'm delighted to be introducing Gillian Waddell, who's the Managing Director and Founder of Fuel PR International. Uh, good morning, evening, Gillian. And good morning. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, Joanne. Hello, everybody. And Gillian uh, is a leading public relations consultant with 30 years in the national and international B2B and B2C communications arena. She's the founder and MD of two premium independent award-winning London-based boutique consultancies, including Fuel PR and new commercial platform Fuel for Amazon. And Gillian works with clients on a myriad of projects to support their reputation, positioning, increased growth and commercial success. Welcome, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can nice you tell us about Fuel PR and what makes it unique? Well, I think it's quite unusual to have uh, a boutique agency. We are not a big business. We're a boutique agency with about 15 people. And one of the things I think has been transformational over the last 15 or 20 years is the fact that, as some of your other speakers have alluded to, London is so very important for international clients looking for growth. Almost all our clients are international businesses um, who view London as a, as, a, as a critical landing platform for success in, 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 their, in their markets. And we've been lucky enough to work with clever, ambitious, forward-thinking businesses. And of course, we've learned from them and I hope we've contributed to their success. But I think being a boutique agency in London, having very international experience, whether it's Australia, where we've had very fortunate, happy experiences, America, or the complexity of Europe with its myriad of different sorts of nationalities and cultural DNAs is, has, is, is, an, is an important element in our success. And we've also heard some horror stories about PR gone wrong. <clears throat> um, what are the myths around public relations that you'd like to debunk? Well, I think everybody thinks PR can be very fluffy, can't it? And people go out for lunch and have drinks and this, that, and the next thing. Um, I think it always comes back to the money. I think it always comes back to, you know, what are you actually trying to do with what, how much budget, over what time? So results and, and clarity of results are absolutely critical, not just for your success, but for long-term successful partnerships with whichever partners you choose to work with. Because I think if you're on the same page and you have joint expectations, of what your outputs are going to be, you will feel much more comfortable, you'll have much better trusted relationships. I mean, things like regulatory uh, compliance, obviously post-Brexit are very important. We were at a trade show last week in Germany, or sorry, in, in Switzerland. And of course, the dismantling of, of, of what's happened here has put up additional hurdles for companies coming in not, not just from a compliance point of view, but from a financial point of view. So getting that straight is obviously important. And knowing very much, who are you actually going to focus on? Who is your target audience? And how likely are you to be able to succeed in reaching out to them? They're, they're kind of myths that people don't often grapple with as arduously as they might do before they actually enter a market. So just in speaking about businesses, <laughs> Um, how, how can PR be used as a powerful tool to cultivate an audience and to build on, you know, using PR to build on company branding and marketing? I think it comes back to the fact, I mean, quite a few people who've spoken before have alluded to the UK being a competitive market. It, it is notoriously difficult here. And underestimating that is, is, is not necessarily the cleverest thing to do. It's not just, you know, that it's competitive and complex, it's that it's regionally very different. Australia is such a big market, you know, from a land point of view, and the UK is a very small market. 
but the towns here like London, Birmingham, Glasgow are very different from a cultural point of view, from a financial point of view, from a social point of view. So actually being able to model make in advance, working out what your strategies are nationally, but not just nationally, also regionally and locally, thinking about how precise you're going to be, you know, having test and learn programs so that you know exactly what you're doing, sort of, you know, fine tuning things as you go along. And obviously understanding that it is going to take time. Things don't happen here overnight. You know, if you're launching into one of the major retailers, it, it may take you three years. And, and what about social media? Um, it seems to be a huge part of connecting with audiences globally. And, and what's your advice to Australian companies using social media to connect with an international audience? Well, I mean, having your SEO working as hard as possible is obviously absolutely critical. And there are endless tools and there's huge amounts of opportunities to work with bloggers and influencers and writers and bloggers, you know, and, and they are important. I mean, one, one of the tricky things is, is actually working out how you assess what their input is. You know, evaluation of, of social media is still harder to come to terms with not least because there are so very many, and here in the UK, a great deal of them want a great deal of money in order to participate. And that's probably a lesson you're going to have to go through in terms of working out which ones are valuable for you and which ones are perhaps more disposable. But they are certainly here, very active. We probably do an event a week uh, with social media targets um, regularly and have done throughout throughout the COVID situation um, of all different types, whether it's an educational training initiative or some sort of gifting. We do a lot of work within health and beauty. Health and beauty is a particularly active category here for Australian companies. Um, and, and influencers and, and social media targets are very important, especially in terms of taking them on a journey with you, perhaps starting small with a small club, you know, and using them to you know, learn about the UK, evolve your relationship, so they grow with you is, is possibly something to consider. Excellent. And, and you do have several companies yeah. on the books who've got a global reach and, and others that are perhaps starting out. Um, what, what are your strategies? Have you got some strategies for both types? So the ones that have a global reach already but haven't entered the UK and ones just starting out? I, I don't think it really matters what sort of size you are. Obviously, it makes a huge difference in terms of your resources. But actually, it's fundamentally about attitude and energy and, and, and clarity in terms of where you're going. Some smaller companies are very successful because they're very entrepreneurial in terms of working out where they want to get to and how quickly. Whereas larger companies can be much more monolithic. They can take a much longer time to make a decision and then perhaps the opportunities have changed or moved on. Um, I don't think it really matters how big you are. I think it matters what goes on between your ears of the people who are actually running the business um, and, 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 and how competent and how energetic and forward thinking and perhaps innovative they are. Excellent. Um, Gillian, is there any like one hot tip you'd give, um, you know, to Australian companies? What's the one takeaway? Do not underestimate how difficult and expensive in the widest sense of that word, the UK can be. It's easy to think, oh yes, we'll go, we'll put a toe in the water, but you need proper people to understand the complexities and the difficulties it is easy because of the same language. That's a huge advantage. And, and New South Wales companies are, to my mind, very good at that. But it is jolly hard work and it's not going to happen overnight unless you're extraordinarily lucky. Julian, thank you so much for um, all your insights um, and views on uh, public relations. I'm going to, now we're coming back to you, Gillian. I'm going to open up to the uh, panel uh, for questions and I invite the audience, please 
uh, bring your questions forward. Uh, I do have some to ask in, while we're waiting for people to bring their questions forward. Um, so we all here on the panel. Okay, good Beck. We've got Peter, Adrian, lovely Gillian. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. Um, there's a few questions while we're waiting for people from the floor to um, ask the panel. Um, marketing communications and public relations are sometimes ignored by businesses because they don't have easy metrics to determine success. So I'd ask sort of uh, Beck maybe first, what, what sort of metrics or how do you determine success uh, with, with a, um, a communications campaign? Mm. You yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, for us, we we do start off by just trying to flag to people that yes, there is a little bit of an element of uh, pixie dust involved here. So it is difficult to measure, even though I do advocate that it is incredibly important to have a comm strategy in place. Um, for us, though. As part of our common strategy, we do produce all of that creative content. So that is a way that we can measure, you know, is this reaching people and how are people actually responding to the message? So, for example, in a video, are people commenting on it? What are they saying? Are they talking about it? Is it kicking off conversation? That's the kind of thing that I would use as a metric, i.e. that engagement. Um, Adrian, a metrics. Um, how are you measuring success? Yeah, I guess we'll, we would work with, or we work with customers on what is it they're trying, what's their goals, and then we work back from there. So for example, is it to get investors? Is it to get to like a series A? Is it to get kind of leads and sales? Whatever's appropriate, we then put those measures in place towards that. So if it's investors, we'll then work on in investor packs. We'll go out and find those to come and talk to them. If it's about sales, again, we'll have metrics to track what's the most effective, marketing or channels with producing and how many leads they're getting. Um, and um, Gillian, metrics on public relations. We quite often do pre-programmed audits. So we benchmark where we are to start with, then we'll probably do a mid-programme audit and an end of programme audit. But as well as that, we do specific, we set up something called KPIs, key performance indexes, which mirror often what the budgetary allocation is or the objectives and the strategy. So we will account quite literally for the type, value, extent of the media coverage, you know, what actually is coming home to roost as a result of social media programs. Uh, and we do it in, in great detail um, because actually, to be honest, everybody wants great results. And if you can prove you've got great results and what the money has actually bought, it goes an awful long way to having happy, successful relationships. So we do all of that at the beginning and we don't do any work at all until we're very clear what the evaluation is going to be down to the last penny. And Peter, you've been involved in all three. What, what mm -hmm. is your take on the metrics? Uh, very simple. Um, just agreeing wholeheartedly what Gillian said. Um, if if you haven't got KPIs, don't do it. So there is one, one of the problems that um, any brands scaling will face is there's, there's a there's a wide range of agencies and partners uh, in marketing that will potentially promise the world and, and yeah, sometimes yeah. not deliver. Um, so obviously, trying to choose a trusted partner is, is is number one. But number two, choose a partner that's going to give you. KPIs, so key performance indicators or, 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 or insights, um, and stick to that. There's, there's so much you can do in marketing with digital marketing nowadays that everything can be tracked. So any, any marketing that doesn't have those plans in place, those metrics in place, those KPIs in place, you don't do them. I, um, I suppose this is open to, to any of you to answer, but um, I mean, there are a lot of KPIs and a lot of metrics. I mean, from, um, you know, in social media, there's lots of metrics that can be tracked. I mean, I suppose it's really finding out what are the most important ones. There might be five or six, but you could probably capture KPIs for 30 or 40 different metrics. So we've got uh, some thoughts on 
you know, what, what are the really important things to measure? I think um, just to kind of echo what Adrian was just saying before, I think it comes down to what your goal is from the beginning. Um, and, and that's really going to inform what sort of metrics you do need to pay attention to, <laughs> which ones you don't really need to pay attention to. Um, and and Gillian, have you got? Is there a one or two specific ones, specific KPIs that you would? I I always try and think of it as if it was my money, what would I spend the money on? Okay, you know, so so money seems to be pretty critical to most people. Most people want to need it in order to grow. So don't spend the money unless you're absolutely clear, and and try and test things. I mean, there is no point arriving from. Australia and thinking you're going to have 100 people for a launch event because they simply will not come. 40, 45% of almost all people never go to any media launches at all. Okay. And quite often you have to do ghastly things like send taxis to go and pick them up, etc, etc, etc. And that kind of behaviour can come as a shock to companies who come from abroad, not just from Australia, where they are not used to the um, type of behavior which happens here in London because things are given on a plate to people like beauty editors or health editors um, in terms of encouraging loyalty towards companies who spent a great deal of time and effort building their reputation and their brands and are not keen for newcomers to come and challenge them in any way. So it is competitive. You need to be very clear about what you're going to spend the money on and what results you're going to get. Otherwise, as Peter says, simply do not do it. Just speaking about being London centric, I think uh, you know we well, we're talking about London, London, London. But you know there are companies and uh, that set up set up outside of London. Um, do they need alternative strategies? I know, Adrian, you just moved outside of London, but are there alternative strategies for outside London, inside London? You know, we talk about the counties, we talk about the north of England, the south. Uh, any insights there? Yeah, we, we definitely, um, like, so we're running some local campaigns for one of our clients at the moment, and we, we are using, even though it's a UK-wide campaign, we are lo using local nuances. So, for example, we've got a campaign that's running in Manchester, the one that's running in, in Wales. We all use cultural differences in those communications that might be as simple as visuals. So make sure, I mean, it sounds obvious, right, but we all use visuals of people in Manchester as opposed to people in London because, you know, it will annoy people outside of the capital if all you do is show your London stuff like I was talking to a guy I think it was the chaps who are running to live a room and, and you know just eating hungry horse and and it, even they have a problem where their staff who live in London all they'll think about is is their own um, experience so everyone's using delivery and deliveries it's not true as soon as you move outside the capital people walk to their corner shop they drive to their supermarket they're not all ordering food you know at a drop of a hat. So again, you've got to make sure that you're being, um, uh, I guess, true to the local area. Otherwise, you do annoy a lot of people. It's very easy to do it. And Beck, what about your experience coming from Australia to London and then working outside of London? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think what Adrian's saying is definitely true about making sure you take your London hat off for a minute and try and <laughs> consider how things might be different outside of the capital. Um, we, we do have some clients sort of around the UK, um, and I think um, often it, it's, it's still, um, for us it still is a great idea to kind of go down that thought leadership piece, but it might be a little bit more hyper-local than looking you know at national issues maybe it is looking at kind of more local issues and local stories and working out how we can add our voice to that local conversation and julian any thoughts on london versus outside of london and your experiences yeah planet london is planet london and it is very much planet london and what happens in glasgow or Hull or sheffield or manchester is is very different the sense of humor is very different the ties, as Adrian has said, are very different. The amount of media, I mean, it's, it is very different. Um, so you have to be, you have to have some sort of strategy in terms of how are you going to cascade 
what you might initially launch with in London, given its importance, particularly in certain sectors like health and beauty, um, how are you going to cascade it out? And uh, this is a question for all of you. Um, uh, Australian companies looking to enter the UK market, um, your advice on picking an agency and how can they find the rest best fit? Because there's many agencies in all facets, in marketing, PR, communications. How, how are um, new entrants from Australia going to find the right agency? Peter, have you, could you... Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I spend a lot of the time doing. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're actually a consultancy, not an agency. So, um, I mean, there's a few things. Um, so, firstly, make sure they align with your values. We talked about values before. So, you know, if you're the type of business that works very long hours and, you know, is, is um, you know, lots of other uh, ways of working, make sure the agency has that. Um, I, I, would, I would strongly suggest you get specialists. You don't get one agency that does everything. Um, you know on, on the call today you've got lots of different specialist agencies who are all brilliant at different things um go with your gut go with your gut feel it's, it's it's normally right in my 25 years experience when i haven't followed my gut i've often regretted it um and and two important things that are really important with marketing F firstly choose one that makes you smile yeah, yeah, it's meant to be fun, fun. Mar marketing is meant to be enjoyable if you don't enjoy it you've got the wrong agency yeah. and, and that ties with choose a choose a partner that actually helps you relax so choose a partner that actually takes the weight off your shoulders, doesn't give you more stress. Okay, what about uh, Beck? Yeah, so um, in addition to um, Peter's advice, I would also say um, when you first sort of meet with, with an agency, get them to talk through what their methodology is and their approach, because um, every agency is going to have a different way of working um, get them to talk through it um, and things I would say suggest to look out for is does that methodology feel like it's going to work for your team obviously will that slot into your way of working also are they being transparent about their methodology or are they trying to keep things from you you know are they speaking to you authentically um, and also, just from a communication point of view, are they delivering things when they say, you know, if they promise to send you a proposal by the end of the week, do they send it by the end of the week or do they send it on Monday? Um, so those are the kind of things I would, I would suggest looking for. Um, and Gillian, um, Peter. Oh, I, I think Peter and Beck have said pretty much what I've said. I, I do think having a sense of humour goes a long way, okay? Mm. You know, I mean, yes, it's all serious. Yes, everybody wants to be successful, but not everything goes according to plan. So you need to be prepared to learn from the mistakes and the cock ups that are going to happen because sometimes they are much more valuable. OK, and having people who are experienced enough, you know, with rounded personalities on both the client side and the agency side in order to be able to roll with that and put a pull up and say, OK, we got that wrong. What can we do? you know, to make it right, actually is a, is a strengthening of a relationship. Often a relationship will be much stronger as a result. Um, and it does make the whole relationship much more fun. Joanne, I'd also say there's, um, there are a couple of uh, trade bodies you can help people. There's one called ISBAR, which is specifically for clients looking for marketing agencies. Um, they can advise, you know, what to look for, who to look for. And then there are a couple of marriage brokers, obviously who will charge a fee, but again, they can advise new clients coming in on kind of what's the best for agency for them. Great. Now, one question that's come up is, is um, who should be the face of a company? Mm -hmm. Should it be the CEO? Uh, should, you know, should it be uh, a representation of the um, customer? Who, who should be the face of a company if, if, if that was a strategy one was to adopt? Peter, if you've got a thought on that. Yeah, well, I've actually dealt with a number of companies where that has been a challenge. I won't, I won't go into the exact detail of, of why or which, which client it was, but I mean, it, it's, it's slightly irrelevant what the title is, but, but, but brands need a, need a public face and they need a leader. So whether that's a chairman, whether that's a CEO, whether that's a managing director, whatever that role is, and, and, and it normally is the CEO, um, 
they should be the lead because each company does need a public face. And, and if a company doesn't have that um, or the CEO um, is not comfortable with that role, you should probably recruit somebody that is in that role or promote from within and move that person to somebody else. It, it often happens with technical businesses where the CEO is, is pretty much a CTO, mm -hmm. but put them in front of a camera and put media in front of him and ask him lots of him or her lots of questions and it, it might go a bit horribly wrong. Um, so yeah, the, 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 each brand does need a, need, a, need a leader, even though there might be other founders be, um, with them. Um, and Bit. Yeah, so I mean, to add to that, I would say you need at least one person. <laughs> but for me, I often encourage um, other people within my clients' businesses to get in front of the camera. And that's something that we'll sort of offer training on as well. Um, I think it's really beneficial for businesses to be able to offer that kind of professional development to their team, you know, go and practice being in front of the camera. Um, but just from a communications um, point of view, for me, it helps grow that authenticity piece. I think here in the UK, um, customers and you know, other businesses, they want you to have a voice and they want you to have an authentic voice. And I think when you when you show other people within your company and, and give them a platform to use their voice as well, and you're all singing from the same song sheet, it just really shows a united front and shows your passion. I, can I add something? I think it depends on why you're using a spokesperson and what the purpose of it's for, okay? So as Peter said, in certain fields, yes, it's right to have, you know, what I call a senior person, whether they're a spook or a scientist may, is up for grabs because they are not necessarily the right person to communicate externally, okay? But I think the other side about it is that often entrepreneurs, particularly evangelists, people who, you know, are the go-getters of the business, want to become the public face, and it can sometimes take over their lives and it's not necessarily good for the business as it grows to be dependent on just one person um, for a variety of different reasons, you know. And so having a panel, as Bex alluded to, is often useful. For example, nutritional advice, if you're a food and drink business, um, communicating with consumer media is, is much more valuable than having some sort of high polluting CEO who's more used to talking to investors or those sorts of financial stakeholders. I mean, we don't, we don't, you don't need anybody like that, okay? Um, but I think it also, as well as being proactive, you have to think about the issues in crisis management in terms of having a small team that can deal with issues in crisis manager. And irrespective of whether the CEO is a thought leader in some areas, he will have to have a bum in the seat in terms of issues in crisis management when things could go wrong because it's his it's his it's his gig. Yes, thank you, Julian. Uh, Adrian, uh, I say we I go with like with sort of the, with the panel answer. I mean, we do if we're doing communications to customers, especially through say things like LinkedIn. What we'll do, we'll advise our clients to find who's the most appropriate person to be sending those messages. So, for example, if it's around, I don't know, maybe they're selling cloud services or something, <clears throat> we want to make sure that it's a well-known person in that field who is sending those comms. So I'd say it's, it's, it's the right person based on who you're targeting. So it's not any one, but it's who's got the most experience relevance. Excellent. So we're just about to come to an end and um, we need um, to um, hear a vote of thanks from Stephen Cartwright. But before we do that, just one last takeaway. Um, I, I must um, let you know that we got really great uh, feedback from the audience, uh, lots of nice comments coming in. Uh, so thank you, audience, um, for that. Uh, just last takeaways, Gillian. We'll go Gillian, Beck, Peter, Adrian. We love working with Australian companies. Please come over as fast as you can. You're great fun and you are very success orientated and wonderfully innovative. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say there is an absolute world of opportunity here in the UK if it is the right fit for you and it's going to work budget wise. And I would say be prepared. And I would say factor in every one of the three um, aspects that us on the panel have, have spoken about today 
plan those in ahead and and absolutely work them into your strategy before you land. And Adrian? I, I, I think we saw, I, I, was, I say test, test digitally, you can do it quick, you can do it pretty cheaply and you can know if it's hopefully if you're going to work. Excellent. And Peter? Uh, to quote Douglas Adams, don't panic. <laughs> If you plan, carry on. If you if you plan it and, and and you know it will work. Excellent. Well, panel, thank you very much. Um, it's been an excellent session. Certainly, the feedback's been great from the audience. Um, and of course, our um, audience can get in touch with you, uh, and we can make all your details available on our website. So, um, thank you all once again uh, for an excellent, informative. Uh, and stimulating session. Um, I'm now going to introduce Stephen Cartwright, OAM, New South Wales Agent General to the UK, EU and Israel. Stephen Cartwright is an experienced entrepreneur, business leader and board director with a track record of successfully building businesses as well as leading Australia, Australia's largest business chamber. Um, he started his career as a cadet mining engineer with Queensland Coal and after four years transitioned into an industrial relations advisory role with the Australian Industry Group. And he then spent two years as a regional industrial relations advocate for the New South Wales Chamber of Manufacturers in the Hunter Valley before being promoted to Deputy Director of Industrial Relations in Sydney. Um, he completed his law degree and became the founding partner of the specialist law firm Fisher Cartwright Berryman. And he's also a founding shareholder and board director of the Charnam Cowell Group when it formed in 1995 and was appointed managing director from 1997 through to 2008. Now, during Stephen's 11 year tenure as the MD and CEO, the company grew from a small privately owned business to an ASX listed company with annual revenues in excess of a billion and 1,200 staff operating from 18 offices across Australia and 14 branded recruitment and consulting divisions. In 2009, he was appointed uh, to the role of CEO of the New South Wales Business Chamber. It's now called Business New South Wales, which is the peak business policy advocacy and services organisation in New South Wales. As CEO, Stephen was able to substantially grow the organisation such that it now employs over 700 staff in 55 offices throughout Australia, China and the UK. He also led a three-year digital transformation project for the organisation which launched in March 2020. Until recently, Stephen was the chairman of the Software Business E-Club and the chairman of International Education Advisory Board to study New South Wales. He's been a director on a number of boards over his career, including the Australia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Human Force Software, Australian Business Lawyers and Advisors. Stephen's built an extensive relationship in business industry and government across New South Wales and throughout Australia. And through his role representing Australia on the International Chamber of Commerce, WCF Council, he's also developed strong networks with business champion leaders across the globe, including in the UK, Europe, Israel, US, South America, and the UAE. His focus for the past decade has been on championing the success of New South Wales businesses, both domestically and internationally. Wow, what a fabulous CV, Stephen, and we should have a session just on you to advise all our uh, members um, on your experiences in business. And I'm going to hand over to you now, Stephen, for the vote of thanks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Um, and can I start by congratulating you and your team um, at the um, Australia-UK Chamber of Commerce for putting on such an exceptional event. Uh, I, uh, I have to say, um, you don't normally, as a business person, get access to a full hour's worth of expertise um, and from, from three different viewpoints um, that we did today. So uh, congratulations to you and your team. I thought it was very good. And obviously the feedback from everybody who was uh, watching today uh, reinforces what I'm saying. It occurred to me as I was listening um, to Adrian, Peter, Beck and Gillian that um, I, 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 as you said, uh, in my prior role, um, helped a, a whole range of New South Wales businesses uh, undertake their export journey into China. 
And uh, at the time, everybody will remember that it was China, China, China was the was the, the story in terms of looking for a new export market and new customers. And what was really clear when we were helping New South Wales businesses on that journey was that they were very readily happy to hire people who understood those markets because it was language difference, it was cultural differences, there were different laws, different market rules, different social norms. So clearly any New South Wales company that wanted to enter into the Chinese market would happily um, take on expert advice on how to navigate that new market. We've got a situation now, of course, where China is becoming a more difficult market and we are now weeks away, we hope, fingers crossed, from the execution of a new free trade agreement with the UK and suddenly, a lot of New South Wales businesses and probably a lot of people watching today are starting to turn their minds to this new opportunity that a free trade agreement with the UK will open up for New South Wales companies. And I think the trap or the, the temptation might be to think UK is the same as Australia, we speak the same language, we like to watch the same TV shows, we drive on the same side of the road. Um, maybe I don't need to get any expert advice. Maybe I simply pick up what I'm doing in New South Wales and put it down in London and away I go without, without that sort of help. The takeaways from me for today, um, from Adrian and from, from Peter about, first of all, have a very good think about whether it's a go, no-go decision before you start investing big dollars in a new market. So take some expert advice right at the very beginning and don't assume that once you're underway, you can relax and, and, and enjoy the ride. It's test, test again, test again, all the way through the process. Beck, um, well, inspirational because he's, a, he's an Australian who's gone to the UK, set up a business, running successfully. Um, and I thought uh, some of the uh, takeaways from me from Beck were uh, the importance of things like thought leadership to get yourself out there in front of the market and the use of video. And I thought that was that was something I hadn't thought a lot about. So I was very you know, grateful to hear that. With Gillian, um, some of the points that I might take away from Gillian's presentation, first of all, don't assume the whole of the UK is London. I think Planet London was the term Gillian used, but very different when you get into other parts of the UK market. Uh, it's going to take time, be patient. Um, it can be difficult, it can be expensive. And uh, not to forget the importance of influences when you're entering a new market with a brand that nobody's really heard of. So look, um, for me, uh, very valuable. I'm sure that everybody listening today found it equally as valuable as I did. Um, and uh, thank very much, thank Adrian, thank Peter, thank Beck, thank Gillian uh, for sharing that um, uh, wisdom, that knowledge and that expertise. And clearly, if anybody is going to go into these markets and you're looking for a marketing expert, a communications expert, or a PR expert, and you know exactly who you should be calling. Um, so uh, can I just finish, uh, Joanne, with just one point, and that is the New South Wales government um, is actually investing very heavily um, in helping companies in New South Wales that are thinking about their export journey, not just to the UK, but US, Tokyo, other parts of the world. Anybody who's listening today who wants to look at whether they're eligible to receive some really uh, detailed and, and strong free support from Investment New South Wales, can I strongly suggest that you go to investment.newsouthwales.gov.au. There's a whole heap of information about uh, programs that we are developing and running to help you in your export journey. So don't be nervous about it. Come to the New South Wales government. We're there to help. And my team in the UK are going to be in place to help you as well. So Joanne, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. It was a wonderful hour and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And Stephen, thank you. And thank you, Investment New South Wales. This is the Access Series uh, number four, and we still have five and six to go. So we'll wait for those exciting instalments. We thank our membership and we thank the people that aren't our members, but we'd very much like you to become a member of the Australian UK Chamber of Commerce. Uh, have a fabulous day, everybody. And thank you to everyone. And again, Investment New South Wales for being such a wonderful sponsor. Thank you.